Hi, I'm Hall History Nerd. Now, you might have seen me on a recent episode of Architecture the Railways Built on the Yesterday channel, talking to the incredibly knowledgeable and enthusiastic Mr. Tim Dunn about the history and architecture of Paragon Station. Now, they were quite sad, and Tim especially so, that they didn't have a lot of time to spend in Hull. They really only focused in on Paragon. They were quite sad that they couldn't get in a lot of the other fantastic industrial railway architecture that Hull has to offer. So here I'm doing a little companion video to that episode to show you some more architecture that the railways built around Hull. Almost all of Hull's surviving railway architecture, apart from Paragon Station and the old ferry station near Victoria Pier, tends to belong to the short but very important Victoria Dock branch line. This short railway line was constructed in the early 1850s to solve the problem of connecting Victoria Dock, which was the first dock built to the east of the River Hull, to the railway network, which was on the western side of Hull. You see, the big problem was that all of Hull's railway infrastructure existed on the western edge of the town, and if you drew a straight line between that and Victoria Dock, you would not only have to cross most of Hull's docks, particularly Humber Dock, you would also then have to cross the River Hull at its busiest place, because the old harbour at this point was still very much in use and extremely busy. So the line had to go out westwards and then curl northwards around the town to the villages of Newland, Stepney, Skullcote, Southcote and Drypool and passing over the river at one of its less busy points, finally connecting the timber dock to the rest of the railway network. It was constructed by the York and North Midlands Railway in its final dying years and the structures that remain are each remarkable in their own ways. Now while most of the Victoria Dock branch line was ripped up during the late 70s and early 80s and most of the embankment that stood around Foster Street has been erased, this one stretch of it still exists and this is the spot right here where Hull's only island railway was. In other words, the platform was an island between the two railway tracks and you would get to it by means of a subway. Steps that went down inside the embankment and the ticket office and the station used to be just at the bottom there. I say used to be, they still are. This is the parapet for the subway and down there is the old station itself. I think we should go and take a look. This cafe on Foster Street that serves workers and lorry drivers from the surrounding industrial works used to be known as Wilmington Station. Built in 1912, this station replaced the earlier Skullcoats and Wilmington stations, saving money for the North Eastern Railway by closing two of their quietest stations and building a new one somewhere in between the two. As we've mentioned, it was unique in Hull's railways in having an island platform. The cafe building here was simply a ticket office and waiting room. You'd buy your ticket, warm your bones by the stove in the waiting area, and when your train was due, head through the back door and into a grand opening in the side of the embankment, which is still there today. Climb the stairs and come up onto a wooden platform that sat between the up and down tracks. Whilst the architecture of the waiting room itself is fairly simple, it's a good example of the small, solid urban stations of the early 20th century. Arched windows and door frames are the only real adornment here, but the real prize is what lies behind this ticket office. Now behind the ticket office is the great subway entrance. This was the spot where you would, with your ticket fresh in hand, enter through these gracefully curved walls into the subway and go up the stairs onto the platform. And these organic curved tiles 
are actually quite common in early 20th century and late 19th century railway architecture. We see them a lot on the London Underground, for instance. What is lovely, I think, here is that you actually get the original Northeastern Railway station colours. So you've got the orange, browny, ruddish colour at the bottom and then the cream at the top with a thin green line running all the way around. Now, whilst today Wilmington Station is a great place to pop in for a bite to eat and a coffee, it's also one of Hull's few remaining preserved stations and Hull's only subway station with its attached ticket office still remaining. Now, quite literally round the corner from the Wilmington Cafe on Stonefury Road is a piece of railway architecture surviving into the modern day so small, so incongruous, yet you blink and you miss it. Now, this small wall in the middle of a busy industrial centre might seem a bit of an odd choice to present as a piece of railway architecture, but bear with me. If you look closely at it, the bottom part is made up of these enamelled tiles, these beautifully faced bricks, which marks it out straight away as being different from the more modern industrial brick that's been plonked on top of it. And that's because this is all that remains of the railway bridge that once carried five tracks over Stone Ferry Road, one of Hull's widest railway bridges. Two tracks to and from Hornsey, two tracks to and from Victoria Dock and Withensea, and another track that serviced the cement works and Wilmington Goods Station. And at some point during the extensive renovation of this whole area and the obliteration of almost every other piece of railway architecture, someone thought it would be a nice idea to keep this. And I'm really glad they did. Just a short walk the other way, eastwards from Wilmington Station, lies our next example of Hull surviving railway architecture. The Wilmington Swing Bridge. The original swing bridge built in the 1850s with the rest of the line was a cast iron single track bridge designed for the trains of the early 1850s. In other words, the designers had absolutely no idea just how much the railways were going to grow, certainly in terms of the size and weight of the trains that would be going over it. This old bridge proved to be a bottleneck for the busy branch line, with trains having to wait as another coming in the opposite direction would slowly, carefully creep across this increasingly fragile bridge. On top of that, the increasing freight trains to and from Victoria Dock and all of the surrounding goods yards were being limited in how much weight they could put on the bridge per axle. With the line becoming an important passenger route thanks to the opening of the Withensea and Hornsey railways in the 1850s and 60s, this was fast becoming a problem. But in 1907, the North Eastern Railway came up with a solution. So this is the bridge that was constructed to replace that original fragile old cast iron single track bridge. As you can see, it's got two tracks, so the bottleneck was no longer a thing. It was much more robust, so more trains could pass over it without slowing down too much. But the construction of it itself is a fascinating engineering story because obviously they didn't want to disrupt the original railway line because it was one of the busiest freight lines in Hull, if not the busiest freight line in Hull. What they did was they constructed this bridge next to the original railway line on the east bank of the river. And when it was completed, a whole assemblage, this entire structure was then put down onto bogies and rails and slowly wheeled out across the river until it was seated on its new mechanism. This was right next to the original bridge. And when that was in place, the line was diverted very slightly to go over the new bridge and the old bridge was dismantled. And of course this wasn't just for railways, there was a, an old right of way for pedestrians across this bridge and that was accommodated with a small wooden walkway that went along the outside edge of the north side of the bridge and you can still see the gates to that to this day. And best of all, the whole thing still works. It's all operated electrically these days from the little pagoda-like uh, control box that sits astride what would have been the railway tracks and if you're lucky enough and you visit at the right time at high tide when a barge is coming through you might get to see this whole beautiful contraption this hundred year old bridge swinging open but of course if you want to see 
something that's almost exactly like this with trains going over it, just go to Selby because there's an almost identical, a slightly older twin of this still operating on the old Hull and Selby route just near Selby station today. Just across the river, next to the bridge, stands a large industrial unit that, upon closer inspection, is revealed to actually be the old Stepney Goods Station, a railway freight hub that would have serviced all of the local industries such as grain mills, tanneries and paint factories. One of my favourite things about Victorian industrial architecture is how they expose the bones of the construction. Today, a building like this would be minimalist and purely functional, with the construction often hidden behind suspended ceilings. But look up into these rafters, and all of the roof's supports are on display. A tangle of pillars and frames and girders, and the scale of it is huge, as it had to be because all day, every day, trains would be running through the arches on the west side of the building, being loaded or unloaded and sent back out again. This would have been a hive of activity, with chemicals bound for the tanneries and paint factories being unloaded and put on carts to be pulled round the corner by horses to their destinations. This would have been full, busy and seething. It's kind of hard to imagine looking at it these days. Now if we travel along the old line just a little bit further westward from the goods station, we cross Beverley Road and find one of Hull's finest pieces of railway architecture. Stepney Station. Now I love Stepney Station. To me, this is the jewel on the Victoria branch line. All of the other stations on this route were fairly simple, relatively unadorned single storey structures as befitting a railway company that was in the death throes of, because of problems with its finances and of course George Hudson, as you'll see in my other videos. And yet this, this seems to come from nowhere and its service is nothing more than a tiny rural hamlet, the village of Stepney, which itself was part of the larger parish of Skullcoats. So I'm still to this day not entirely sure why so much attention was put on this building, but look at it. You've got Norman arch windows. You've got this kind of neoclassical entranceway around the doors. Look at all the dentition work up in the eaves. And then this beautiful polychromic brickwork where you have these kind of, most of it's redstone, but the rest of it is all this kind of sort of pale cream colored brick that outlines each of the separate bays. And my favorite architectural detail of all, if you look at the chimney breasts, the stacks have got that very characteristic GT Andrews arch, though this wasn't designed by GT Andrews, but the arch is done in yellow brick and the lines of the yellow brick follow the lines of the two legs of the chimney stacks down the side of the building, down the side of the ends. That's a lovely little detail that really springs out to me that clearly a lot of attention was lavished upon this building. And these sort of things, they don't come cheap. This kind of architecture is very expensive. Now, one possible reason why so much attention was lavished upon this might be down to the fact that it was right next to the Beverley Turnpike, the main road between Hull and Beverley. And as a result, it would have been the most visible of all of the stations on the Victoria Dock branch line by the public and particularly by public who were perhaps a little wealthier. Beverley was a well-known place for wealthy people to live. But whatever the reason, I'm really glad we've still got this station because it really is a gem of 1850s railway architecture. So whilst Paragon Station quite rightly gets the lion's share of the attention for its architecture, what with it being the swan song and the magnum opus of one of the most celebrated railway architects of British history, it's worth remembering that there are lots of other hidden railway architecture gems around the city, some of which you might not have been aware were ever part of a railway in the first place.